Welcome to the CWTS Enterprise Wi-Fi Fundamentals video learning course. This course will cover all 10 chapters of the official CWTS instructor-led training course using the official courseware to help you prepare for the CWTS exam. In this video, we'll be covering Chapter 7 of the CWTS course, Wi-Fi Under the Hood. Each chapter is covered in a separate video. In this chapter, we're going to take a step deeper into the ways of Wi-Fi. This chapter will build on what we've learned in previous chapters. The four topics listed here are absolutely critical for understanding how Wi-Fi works, and sometimes why Wi-Fi doesn't work properly. The common theme in this chapter is to understand how Wi-Fi devices use the wireless medium to transmit data. This includes a discussion about how 802.11 stations attempt to cooperate and share the wireless spectrum efficiently. Before we get into the details of how Wi-Fi works at a protocol level, we have to understand one basic principle of wireless communication. That is that wireless utilizes a shared medium. If you think briefly about wired networking, the carrier medium is a data cable, which is an isolated medium. The cable connects two endpoints only and is shielded from causing interference to other nearby stations. In Wi-Fi, the carrier medium is the air, which is accessible to all. It's almost impossible to shield the wireless medium in any practical way. So on a given radio frequency, when two stations are near one another, only one station can talk or transmit at a time. This is referred to as being a half-duplex medium. To get a better grasp on what half-duplex means, consider your cell phone. You can either talk or listen, but you can't do both at the same time because that wireless communication is half-duplex. Wi-Fi is very similar in that respect. Thus, the goal of Wi-Fi protocols is to establish rules about when to talk and when to listen. The first step in these protocols is to follow a listen-before-talk process called Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance, which is abbreviated as CSMA slash CA. Wi-Fi devices are not capable of hearing or detecting data collisions on the wireless network. Therefore, the first goal of 802.11 protocols is to minimize collisions. There are several steps in this process, and we won't necessarily expect you to memorize them all. But let's take a quick look at the basic process. The first step is called carrier sense. As you could guess, this is where the wireless station senses the air to determine if another station is already transmitting. Wireless stations must listen before they talk, and carrier sense is the listening part of this process. They listen for RF energy, and they also attempt to listen to all Wi-Fi data. In a Wi-Fi frame, the transmitting station notifies all nearby stations how long its conversation will last. And in this way, 802.11 is a very polite protocol, because stations will listen and wait for other stations to finish before they start talking. But if a station decides that the wireless medium is not being used, that doesn't necessarily mean that station can go ahead and transmit. There are other steps to the process. When a station has data to transmit, it randomly selects a back-off timer, which is simply a waiting time. The station must count down this back-off timer until it reaches zero. But while it's counting down, it must continue to listen to the wireless medium. If another device reaches zero first, that device will transmit, and other devices in the area will stop the countdown, listen, and wait. When the transmission is done, the countdown resumes. The random backoff timer is a way to randomize device transmissions such that it is less likely for two stations to transmit at the same time. So Wi-Fi has several steps to avoid collisions. It uses listen before talk, it's polite, and waits for other stations to finish a conversation, it selects a backoff timer at random, and it continues to listen. These processes do not prevent collisions, but they do minimize collisions. In networks with a lot of devices, collisions will increase. In previous chapters where we discussed the principles of radio waves, we briefly described that a radio wave is encoded with data. The process of changing radio waves in a predetermined pattern is called modulation. There are several different kinds of modulation. As you can see on the bottom right portion of this slide, there are different ways to change the radio waves. At the top of the box is a series of digital bits, 10110100. Below the digital bits are radio waves that have been modulated to indicate the same bit series. 
The first example shown here is called amplitude shift keying. By changing the power or amplitude of a radio wave, a wireless station can indicate a change in digital information. You can see the pattern here where the higher power wave represents a 1 and the lower power wave represents a 0. This is called amplitude shift keying. Below that is an example of frequency shift keying. You can see that the wavelength, which is directly related to frequency, becomes longer and shorter with each change in digital information. In other words, the frequency is modulated to indicate a change in digital information. Finally, at the bottom is phase shift keying, which changes the phase of a radio wave to indicate a change in data. This is a little more difficult to perceive, but you can think of phase changes as a way of adjusting the current point of a wave's cycle. Phase shift keying is the primary modulation method used in Wi-Fi, though amplitude shift keying is also used. These examples are all somewhat basic, but they should illustrate the idea of how modulation works. Radio waves are adjusted to represent digital data. In Wi-Fi, there are several different types of modulation. When the complexity of a modulation scheme increases, more data can be represented by a radio wave. However, a more complex modulation method will be more error-prone because the changes in the wave will be more subtle. Therefore, more complex modulation requires a strong signal and a clean channel with little interference. More simple modulation methods carry less data, but they are more resilient to interference. A mixed mode environment is an area of a network where there are different types of devices such as 802.11b, 802.11g, and 802.11n. Each of these physical layer technologies uses a different set of modulation methods, but those methods are incompatible. In other words, an 802.11b station cannot understand 802.11g and 802.11n transmissions. However, 802.11g and n stations can understand 802.11b because they are backward compatible. Nevertheless, the incompatibility creates an issue for the polite listen-before-talk cooperation strategy described in previous slides. A good analogy for this problem is human languages. 802.11b only speaks one language. Let's say that's Spanish. 802.11g stations are more sophisticated, so they know both Spanish and French. They understand 802.11b Spanish, but 802.11b doesn't understand them when they speak in French. Then 802.11n comes along and speaks Spanish, French, and German, but neither 802.11b nor 11g understand German. So this is the problem. In a mixed mode environment, station must coordinate their transmissions in a way that is understood by all stations in the area. Note that this doesn't mean they must all always speak in the same common language, but it does mean that they must notify one another of their intent to speak in a different language. This allows the other stations to be polite and wait, even if they don't understand what's being said. However, it does make the flow of conversations less efficient, which we'll address on the next slide. Mixed mode environments like the one we just described require something called protection mechanisms. A protection mechanism is simply a way to protect a forthcoming transmission by notifying the neighboring stations. It's a bit like saying, hey, I'm going to speak in German for a minute, so hold on. Then the station would speak in German to a peer that also speaks German. Newer devices like 802.11n recognize the presence of older devices like 802.11a, b, and g. Similarly, 802.11a and g stations recognize the presence of older 802.11b stations. In mixed mode environments, protection mechanisms are important for the flow of conversation. The use of protection mechanisms does decrease performance, but it also enables newer, higher speed stations to use the fastest data rates. So on the whole, protection is a helpful process. Protection mechanisms work in two basic ways. For client stations, the primary method is called Request to Send, Clear to Send, or RTS-CTS. The client sends an RTS, or Request to Send, frame in a common language to the access point, and the access point sends a CTS, or Clear to Send, in a common language back to the client. All stations in the area hear these protection frames, understand them, and wait for the conversation to finish. 
While the other stations are waiting, the client sends its higher speed data without interruption. An RTS CTS is used by client stations because they need the help of the access point to notify all other stations in the area. By definition, all stations in the basic service set can hear the access point. So the AP's CTS notifies all surrounding stations. The second protection mechanism is called CTS to self. Access points use CTS to self because all stations in the basic service set can hear the access point. A CTS to self serves the same purpose as an RTS. It notifies all of the surrounding stations about the forthcoming exchange so they can remain quiet and wait. Another RF phenomenon that potentially decreases performance is interference. Interference is sort of a catch-all word that can mean any source problem that causes data corruption. We talked earlier about the modulation process, and interference impacts the receiver's ability to interpret the data that is modulated in a radio wave. There are two basic types of interference, modulated and unmodulated. Modulated interference comes from radio devices that are transmitting some type of data. These can be Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi devices. For example, a wireless video camera can transmit data with a modulated wireless signal, but the video camera may not play by the same rules as Wi-Fi devices do. So if a Wi-Fi network is located near a video transmitter on the same frequency, the camera transmits all the time, but it never gives the Wi-Fi devices a chance to transmit. Depending on the type of modulated interference source, the performance of the Wi-Fi network can be impacted slightly or severely. The video camera shown here could completely disable a wireless network, preventing it from transmitting any data traffic whatsoever. The other example shown here, a Bluetooth headset, will create some interference, but modern Bluetooth devices incorporate Wi-Fi avoidance techniques, which improves coexistence. A single Bluetooth device would have a very minimal effect on the Wi-Fi network. The trick with modulated interference is that there are so many different kinds, you just never really know what you might get. A spectrum analyzer, which measures RF energy in radio frequencies, is a tool that allows us to measure interference and determine its impact on our wireless networks. Unmodulated interference can have the same impact on Wi-Fi as modulated interference. However, unmodulated interference is simply a source of RF noise that does not carry data. In other words, these devices produce RF energy as a byproduct of their general function. A microwave oven is the best example of a source of unmodulated interference. Microwave ovens almost always have some amount of energy leakage, and that leakage affects portions of the Wi-Fi frequencies. Unmodulated interference can be tricky to isolate because they are not typically listed in an organization's list of wireless systems, but their impact is no less important. They have the ability to completely disable a wireless LAN on certain channels. That's all for this chapter of the CWTS Enterprise Wi-Fi Fundamentals course. Do you have questions about how Wi-Fi works under the hood? If so, go to cwnp.com forums and engage your peers on the CWNP discussion forums. Ask and answer real-world questions and help prepare yourself and your peers for the CWTS exam. Good luck.